This is the Absolute Business Mindset Podcast, created and hosted by Mark Hayward. This podcast will interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and people in their careers. We will delve into their journey to success, key life milestones, and go deep into their area of expertise. Get ready to learn from other successes and failures. Today, we have Angel Ribbo, who is the CEO Confident. Hello, Angel. How are you? Hi, Mark. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And obviously, thank you, everybody who's listening to us today. Well, thank you for joining me. It's, it's, it's going to be an absolute pleasure, I'm sure. Um, so you, what I just wanted to give people at the start is a, a quick synopsis of who you are, what you do at the moment, and sure. then we'll go back and tell the story. So, so you help sales teams be profitable custodians, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about later on what a profitable custodian is, in sales negotiation, equity creation, and all based in Dallas, US at the moment. Is that right? Yes. Thank you. Right. We are going to go back to your university at Catalonia, your engineering computing engineering degree. But I want to just touch on one thing first. You speak six languages. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so is that is that all based around your traveling and where you've lived in the different locations or it was there languages that you wanted to learn and you went and learned them? Well, that's a great question. First of all, as, as you know, you know, I, I come from Catalonia and I was born uh, one hour away from Barcelona. So we are right south of the border with France. So in my school, at my age, English was not taught. So okay. French was the only option. So thank God that was the case, because otherwise I would have never learned. I would have never learned French. So, you know, I really for some reason, I was really ready to learn foreign languages. Probably one of the reasons is why is because as you know, in Barcelona, in Catalonia, we speak Catalan, which is a, mm -hmm. a language between Spanish and French, right? So we have more sounds, phonetic is more complicated. So I was learning French there. And mom and dad, they said, hey, Angel, although they don't speak a single language, a single language besides Spanish and Catalan, they said, Angel, we want you to learn English at the same time. So they enrolled me on a private school. So since I think it was uh, fifth, fourth grade, I was going, I was, I was learning French in school and I was learning English outside of school. And then magic happened, which was, you know, mom and dad were, were you know, they, they, they saved some money for me and my sister to go to Scarborough in the UK yep. to learn English. And that was in 1981, 82. So that means that I was 13 years old. And that changed my life forever. You know, when it, if, if you have ever tried to learn a foreign language, you know, you're always translating, right? You're always translating. So me going for a month, to Scarborough meant that I went to Scarborough having to translate everything in my mind. And when I came back, I didn't have to translate anything. Mm -hmm. I was speaking English automatically, yeah. automatically. I mean, I remember going back to my private school class and everybody was, wow, you've really learned a lot. And I, I have to tell you that that trip, not only my sister went to the same school in Scarborough, but also my cousin. And I did the following thing. I had, I had, I was given the choice who do you want to stay? I mean, what kind of family do you want to have? And I said, I want to be in a family in which I don't speak a word in Spanish, of Spanish, in a month. Right. And they put right. me in a family. I still remember mom and dad and the three kids they have, two boys and one yeah. girl. I was sharing the room with a Swedish guy. Right. It was a Swedish guy. So I was, and the thing is, God helped me so much. This Swedish guy, oh my God, was he an introvert? Okay. Was he an introvert? So I was, I spent the entire month speaking English with the family and yeah. they would take me everywhere and they would, we would go to so many places. And also the one good thing I did was I asked my Swedish uh, flat, excuse me, uh, roommate, Hey, do you have some friends here? She said, yes, absolutely. I have so many, so many Swedish girls, which, which came from Sweden, which are also in the same school. I could right. introduce you to them. Guess what? When I wasn't with my English family, I was with these Swedish girls. Right. And right. from a Spaniard, that was a blast. Oh my God, did that summer change my life forever? And did I, did I not practice my English language skills? <laughs> so that was, you know, really, that was literally how I ended up learning uh, English and French. And then, you know, I started traveling. Uh, when I went to college, I was part of an international organization. I was the president for that organization. And then I, I you know, I went to, fr to France with an internship. 
but I also uh, I also started to be exposed to um, to uh, Portugal. So I had to learn I had to learn Portugal Portuguese, excuse me. And then I, le I learned a little bit of German because I was I was uh, for uh, two years I was you know dating uh, uh, a, you know wonderful beautiful German girl. So I was literally visit her, visiting her or she was visiting me uh, almost every week. So I was going to Germany a lot. So you know you know when you're kind of your everything in your life is taking you to a place where if you just surrender to it, you keep on learning and learning and learning. And you know, eventually I used my Portuguese that I learned with a Portuguese student in Barcelona. I used it when I was doing business in conducting business in Brazil, you know, and when I when I later on in my career, I moved from Barcelona to the UK to work uh, for a technology company. Guess what? I was asked to call in English to the Nordic countries and to Germany. So I was making sales calls from the UK right. to those countries. So it's kind of, I always had to make an effort. Mm -hmm. Like I, I had to put myself in a, in a, in a discomfort zone yeah. <laughs> in order to learn another language. And, and, and learning a language, right? I, 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 I'm confessing here, I am a typical <laughs> Englishman who struggles with languages. I trained, I was at school, did six years of Spanish and a couple of years of German and really struggled. I, I, I just didn't have the natural flow of it. But how do you construct learning a language uh I, the immersion technique it sounds like you 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 immersed yourself in culture in people and and that's how you learned it but but they're all latin languages so they, they all have a sort of similarity but how how did you sort of approach learning language as you said you, you're you're sort of translating everything in uh, spanish to english english to spanish yes um but what what sort of techniques did you use to 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 get your languages and, and and embed and understand with such fluidity? Your English is fantastic, and I know you're in the US Thank now, you. so you do use it every day. But um, how was how did you approach learning the languages? Well, this is a great question. I remember when I was once paid. I think what my first employer when I left college, they paid for for lessons, um, uh, and uh, I I think it was Portuguese. And they they actually enrolled me. Uh, I don't know if I can use you know commercial names, but for this yeah, at, at this school Berlitz, which they're very well known for languages and you know to teaching languages, foreign languages to executives. Yeah. And they would typically, even if you don't know anything about that language, you start listening to it. You mm. start you know you don't know anything, but you start. I mean, your brain. There's something in your brain mm. that suddenly starts being comfortable, mm. familiar with certain sounds. Mm. And you know, the more you are exposed, I remember, I remember when I first learned English, when I was, I told you my story to to Scarborough, mm. having the TV set that we had in the room always on, always on, always on. It doesn't matter, you know, always on. I would never do that today with the amount of fear that there is in the news. But you know, at that point, you know, it's always getting used to the language, always getting used to the language, even if I didn't understand what they were saying. Mm. It doesn't mm. matter. So you 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 actually used them and. Um, a word which called which is called immersion. There's a there's a guru in 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 in, in human behavior which is who is uh, Tony Robbins. Oh right? yeah, I, mean, I know Tony. If you yeah. ever yeah. exactly, if you ever listen to obviously you have and or you attend yeah. one of his events, right? Yeah. He talks about immersion all the time. He always makes this funny story when he started to learn polo, you know, being on his horse and everything. Mm -hmm. Immersion, immersion. Even if you had to pay to learn a skill, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you can like literally land. You know, like like uh, land in a place where that particular skill is being is being used. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. It mm. doesn't have to be perfect. But put yourself in, in a position in which you are stressed out. Literally, right. you right. know, you don't feel comfortable because you don't understand anything. It doesn't matter. But you know, your brain is starting to tune into yeah. the expressions, the phonetics. Uh, as you know, there's a, there's there's a certain way that every language has like its its own music. Yeah. Besides its own syntactics and grammar and everything, it has its own music. I think that that music is as important <laughs> and as the language and those the words themselves. Mm -hmm. That has been my experience, uh, Mark. 
fantastic thank you for that so so um let's go to your uh, your university degree so you did engineering computer engineering so um, exactly. at the university of catalonia um yeah, yeah. so so just tell me a little bit about your upbringing in 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 barcelona and uh, and why you chose to do computer engineering as a degree yeah that's a great story. I'm mean, just having, you know, memories from my high school time now. <laughs> so I, I was born in a city, you, 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 you speak Spanish, you've probably been in Spain. I was born in a city called Lleida, which is one hour away from Barcelona. Okay. So it's a 250, 300,000 people, you know, city. So it's a small, it's a still a small town. So um, when I was, uh, you know, in, in high school and actually in, in middle school as well, that started in middle school, I really love computers. I didn't have a computer at home. Mm. I didn't have a computer at home. But in school, we had this lab, with, this lab with four computers. And they were, I don't know if there was an, they were of a British brand or an American brand. They were called Acorn, Acorn. Acorn. Yeah, yeah, B, uh, yeah. It was, it oh, was you remember BK. that? Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I remember, I, 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 right now I have in my mind the lab with those computers. Yeah, yeah. That one of them, guess what, had a tape recorder. So I could record my programs. Right. Oh my God, I, I loved it. I mean, I totally, totally loved it. I remember that thanks to that, my mom, my dad bought me an Apple IIc computer while I was in high school, Apple IIc, right. right? So it was the most fancy Apple II that existed at that time. One of the few in the, in the place where I was, actually the only dealer in that place, they knew me because I was all the time there looking for, you know, software and everything. So that's how I started to like computer science and computer engineering. I was really good in, in, in programming, you know, in my, as I was progressing, uh, actually one of the, my, my father was a CEO of a conglomerate of, uh, you know, food related industry, right. uh, you know, companies. And he asked me, Hey, could you do this inventory program for us? Yeah. And then suddenly it, for the entire summer, I started to write in basic language, yeah. okay, a program for, you know, taking, taking, you know, for, for controlling the inventory of that particular, it actually was a fish farm. Okay. So, and I loved it so much. It was so good. Obviously, I always had great, great grades. So when it was time, my last year in high school, when I was a senior, and I was, I, I was asked in Spain, you have to go through a through, I mean, a, there's a grading system, right? And you had, I had to pick which which schools I wanted to, which which colleges and universities. And I said, okay, so I would like to go to the school, you know, computer engineering school in the Technical University of, of Catalonia. And I was, you know, thank God I had very good grades, very good grades, so I could get really into computer science. Yeah. But guess what? The oh. first year was physics, math, calculus, <laughs> Uh, you know, programming, uh, theory of information theory. I, with all due respect okay, to all my professors and teachers and everything, I hated it. Oh, I hated okay. it. Okay. I, I mean, the first semester was, I mean, I barely could pass a thing two of the, of the subjects. I mean, it was, it was really difficult. And then the second semester, oh my God, oh my God. I said, I don't like it. If this is computer science and computer engineering, I don't like it. I liked programming a little bit. I like you know the soft part of engineering of of, of uh, information technology, mm. but I didn't like any of the rest. I said, "Oh my God, it's five year degree." Okay, I'm only at the second one. Oh my God! To be honest, I said, "I don't know how am I gonna do this, but whatever." You know, um, you know, my parents are paying for this. I had to move from Lleida to Barcelona, so they were paying the rent and everything. <laughs> so fast forward, to be honest, I had to wait, wait actively three more years until again, I liked computer engineering subjects because they were more like, you know, computer engineering or computer science in organizations, information systems, yeah. you know, stochastic processes, things that were really more attached to reality yeah. as opposed to, you know, calculus. Theoretical and, side. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I am a very hands-on guy. You know, I really like to be around with people and I, I like to have human, human contact, you know? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I really, I picture myself, am I going to be a computer analyst programmer the rest of my life? Oh my God, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to be Angel Rebo at all. That's why, as, as you have read, that's why, you know, really after I finished my degree, I said, I have to do something more related to business. 
because I think that's that's exactly where I could make a big, a big, before, a big impact. Before we go on your yeah. MBA, uh, yeah. just on, just on the computer engineering, and 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 it might be, it might be slightly different. Because, uh, I want to clarify. So we have in the UK something called computer science, mm -hmm. um, and that is that is basically learning languages. And 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 I'm interested. Um, I was talking to someone, a, a friend of mine who. Um, learn languages and then learn computer science and that was like javascript and c sharp and all that sort of jazz and he said that actually it was very easy to learn because it was just learning a new language did you have the same experience there as well no 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 okay. that was that was actually it was called a degree when i started it was called computer science Right. But as all the, let's say, the names and titles changed throughout my career, actually, they eventually called it, called it computer engineering. So okay. I started the studies, they being, were being named like that. Right. But as far as computer languages, no, we didn't really learn, you know, this many of the computer language at all. I mean, I remember using, after the second semester, we did not learn any language anymore. So you didn't learn the program, the programming. You were what we building learned, the, the the hardware, building the computers. And we everything. we learned both hardware and, and software. But what right. I'm trying to say, they taught the programming, the languages that they taught us, or, or the programming, the programming that they taught us were language independent. Right. Okay, right. so it was very much on how to do things, but not specifically with a language. We were using a universal language, and then literally we were given the free the freedom to use the language that we wanted. It right. could be any language. So that was, I mean, again, but if, if you realize maybe if it was more like specific languages, maybe I would have liked mm -hmm. it more. I don't know, but the reality is that everything seemed to me to abstract and i wanted really to i wanted to go back to earth and that's you know as, as i mean reflecting upon what i had done in, in high school again it was very down to earth i was able to deliver a specific results you know i mean as much as I, I am a strategic guy but to be honest i i i'm a strategic as far as the rubber can hit the rubber can hit the road really right otherwise right. it doesn't serve me right. you know it, it doesn't serve me and I need to see those results because at the end of the day, I think that has helped, that has helped me a lot in my in my life in general, like really wanting to wanting to see those specific results, those specific outcomes of everything that I have done. Yeah, yeah. So, so you then did an MBA in Barcelona. Yeah. Um, was that to give you the business experience? Yes. Actually, and one other question. Sorry, follow up question. Yeah, of course. At that time, doing an MBA. Did you want to be a, an employee working for a big, uh, whether it's computers or whether it was a, a business or finance, wherever? Did you want to work for a big corporation, or did you did you want to be an entrepreneur at that stage? That's a great question. I'm going to tell you. So while I was studying in order to make money, I was actually working at the same time, right. and I actually I was working giving education, you know, computer education, teaching Word Perfect and on Lotus one, two, three, you know, to the, to the employees of the university of my own college. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, the first job that I got before I graduated, I was actually at the rector's office at the president's office of my own university. Oh, wow. Okay. Because they opened a position in the international, it was called the rector's office, department of international relations. And that oh. was my first job. My real first full-time job was like this. So it wasn't related to technology at all. So right. while I was having that, I, while I was, you know, doing that job, I was there for five, six years. I was actually studying, you know, my MBA. Mm -hmm. If you ask me why, because I really wanted to have a different perspective of the world. I wasn't thinking of where am I going to work? What kind of role I want to have? I wasn't that strategic. The only thing I knew was that I needed to have additional knowledge if I wanted to go with a, a, a higher level of comfort to work for any corporation. Right. So, so I started working with, with in international programs and then I started traveling extensively, right. you know, right. and we had, we had these wonderful relationships and, and trips to the UK to talk to the Imperial College yeah. and the University of Manchester School of uh, Architecture. And we would go to all these many, you know, universities in Europe uh, and also in, in, in the US and in the Latin America, which were mainly the places where, 
we would have, you know, relationships and programs and things going on, right? So that was actually my first full-time job. And it was uh, thanks, well, thanks to a bad personal experience that actually I decided to move out of Spain. But when I was still working, and let me tell you a story because you're gonna, you're gonna like it. When I was still working at the university, a headhunter came, a female headhunter came one day and said, right. Angel, we want you in the private sector. I have this opportunity for you. I cannot disclose how I found you. And actually I still don't know today why, okay. <laughs> but well, I know why, but I don't know how they found me. But anyway, okay. we would like you to work in this particular company. I think you would make a great fit. And it was an audiovisual company, okay? So they would, yeah. they would do all sorts of audiovisual productions of any size. It would be the launch, the launch of a new car for, you know, J Jaguar, mm. or it could be like the 100th uh, anniversary of FC Barcelona, just right. to give you a couple of examples. Yeah. But the reason why I mentioned this is because eventually I was uh, fired from that company. Okay, so that what was interesting. Think? What did so you do? What did I not do? What That's did you not thing. do? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot of politics involved, a lot of politics involved in that company. I was hired by one guy and I made the mistake, which is I allowed myself to say, to, to, to be, to accept a position because this guy said, hey, we are reorganizing the, the, the this, this, um, um, part of the company and I'm not going to be your boss anymore. So before I hand you over to the new boss, I want to give you the opportunity to go to another side of the company. It's up to you. You decide what you want to do. Right. Okay. And I, I mean, I really didn't know, no, no, my, nor my potential new boss at that division or this other boss. So I said, okay, let's go to this other boss, this other division. And that was my life sentence. <laughs> okay. That was, but anyway, you know, but that's okay. And that was, well, you, before... learn, you learn from these experiences, don't you? you oh learn. my God. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, I was supposed to be in charge. Do you remember the 2000 effect? How the how go, how going from 1999? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Y2K or whatever it was called. Exactly yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. 2K effect. You know, the, yeah, the, nothing the, happened. Exactly, <laughs> nothing happened. Nothing happened. How the clock many, just how ticked many, over. <laughs> how many how many trillions of dollars of pounds were spent for that, right? But anyway, so I lost my job, and then I had this conversation with my headhunter. Hey. I'm, I'm glad that I, st I stayed at that company more than six months, so you get your full fee. Mm -hmm. I told I told the headhunter, but okay, can, could you tell me why did you really come to you know pick pick me from the university and take me to this private company? They were really a good company, a large and very very well known. And she goes, well, because I needed someone really flexible. Okay. I really I needed someone. There was something that I really liked at the interview with you, Angel, which was your and, and she said, so if, you're, if you're ready for this explanation, Mark, she said, you, your feminine side, your feminine side was the part that really attracted me. And I said, what? I mean, and what did you go, <coughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> obviously, I, I mean, I've, I've lived in so many, I mean, I mean, I'm so open to, you know, all obviously so, you know, many, you know, sexual orientations, you know, I'm, 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 I have friends all over the place with all, 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 all orientations. So I said, what do you mean? Right, because I wanted to know. And she said, you know, I want you to know something. And actually it was the first time ever someone told me about this. So we all have this feminine side and this masculine side. We all have this. Like it or not, it's a reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for what you stand in the world, you have this flexibility that's very difficult to find, you know, in, in, in full fledged <laughs> masculine roles yeah. for men. And you know, I found this in you, and I, I knew that you were going to do a good job, regardless of what happened at the end. So anyway, so that was that was my last job in in Spain, and then it was when you know the universe had a wonderful position for me in the UK, uh, you know, and that's how I. How and, I and so, what did you do in the UK? Yes, I so I worked for my first ever American company. Right. It was a you know it was a it was a high tech company in this technology park in Fleet. Yep. Um, I think is it is it Hampshire Fleet, Fleet. Uh, Hampshire yeah I think it's Hampshire exactly so and uh, basically I was I was uh, I was a part of the inside sales team I started as an inside sales guy and then yep. inside sales team leader and I was like uh, basically first 
making phone calls, a lot of phone calls, mm -hmm. trying to get appointments for my field reps. Right. And my field reps were in different countries and I handed over those leads to them. And then I became a team leader. Uh, and, and that's what I was doing. It was my really, my first sales role ever. And I loved it. I yeah, loved you enjoyed it. it. People, it's oh, a people business, isn't it? It's a people business, yes. And and I, we had all those call blitzes, you know, that we had to make X number of calls. And if you reach that goal, then you had a you had a bonus, and then oh. you you would talk to the field reps, and they were super excited that you got you got them this amazing uh, you know sales appointment with the CEO of that corporation. Yeah. You know that was so exciting. I really loved it. I really liked it. And then I see you moved to Mexico. Is that right? To do sales exactly. there as well. I, I, exactly. I moved to Mexico. Uh, I was at, I was the company I was working with in the in the UK American company. You know, I I I went to uh, uh, to a sales boot camp in Boston. They were based in Boston, mm. and I decided to take a vacation after that boot camp in Boston. And I said, I'm going to take a vacation. I've never been in in, in Mexico as a, as a tourist, and then I'm going to go to Cuba. And it was while I was in Cuba. And that's the reason why I moved then from, to Mexico. I had my first experience, a spiritual experience ever. I mean, I, I was very down to earth and I, I didn't know what a spiritual experience meant. So I remember reading that book uh, while I was in Cuba. And I, I was reading, a, this book is called The Celestine Prophecy. I don't know if you've ever heard of this book. No. The Celestine Prophecy, okay. I, I recommend it to you. Okay. It's, it's written by a guy called James Redfield. James Redfield, The Celestine Prophecy. It's basically a book that talks about the energy and how everything is energy and everything around us is energy. I love the concept. When I was, you know, when you're reading something and you're feeling that you already know that mm -hmm. and you're feeling excited mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the story about a series of scrolls that are being found in the Amazon side of Peru. Okay. Right. Uh, um, so it's, it's an amazing book, it's, it's, it's a fiction book but the, the teaching just was amazing so i remember turning the last page of the book and as soon as i did that i had this rush of energy going through me i, I mean i cannot explain it goosebumps chills you name it yeah and i knew that i had to do something i mean i remember when the sun was setting i was in varadero in cuba in that nice resort and literally at that moment i decided I want to go to work in Latin America. Okay. I went back to Fleet. I mean, I never explained this to anybody. Okay, now everybody knows because I have explained the story, but I never explained that to my managers, but I told my managers, both American, I told them, um, hey, I would like to go to work in Latin America. You tell me where you have an, you have an opening. And they said, well, we would like you in Mexico, but hey, are you insane? What do you mean? Hey, you're working here in the UK. You have a great job, great progression. Look what you have done in under two years. Mm. And, you know, this is, you're making good money. Why do you want to go to a third world country? Why would you think of doing that? And I said, why not? <laughs> <laughs> why not? You know, what, what what's wrong? And, and, you know, in this case, what's Mexico? What's Mexico? And, you know, there's, I mean, Mexicans love Spaniards. Spaniards love Mexicans. Mm. Um, there's so many things in common mm. among you, the, the two, you know, the two cultures. And I said, I mean, I, I would love to go to Mexico. And, and I think that there's a lot of things that I can do in, while in Mexico. Just, just before you talk a little bit more about Mexico. So you were saying about a, that book that had a, a massive impact. So yes. I, I started binging audio books on business, finance, self-development, all this jazz um, I don't know it's probably six or seven years ago now really? and um, and I, I interviewed someone who said you should read The Alchemist have mm -hmm. you read The Alchemist oh absolutely so I so I, I was binging on this business stuff and he's like no, no no this will give you a really good perspective it will open your eyes it will it will it will spiritually help you and I was a bit cynical but I listened to it on audiobook and it changed my life. It really changed my life. Having that perspective on people's behaviors, people's um, way, way people uh, react and the way I should react or the way the character 
in the story reacts to situations and 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 i i just i, I I'm, I'm even while i'm telling you about this little story i'm i'm even thinking of the stories within the the, the actual story so um so i know what you mean it, it, i i didn't decide to move to mexico or anything but <laughs> it, 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 I, I definitely know what you mean that non-fiction books can have like because as i said i've binged on business books but that that really was a, a, a life changer and, and a really inspiring book. So sorry, I, I just wanted to just pop that in there. Um, sorry, you no, were saying I, about Mexico. I, no, so but you... they would like no. But I, I mean, to your point, I mean, I downloaded my first my first Audible book before Audible was even an Amazon company, and and I, I think it's a great companion. I think yeah. that I think that you know for while I'm in the shower, while I'm driving, while I'm commuting, yeah. I mean, while I'm exercising. Yeah. Audiobooks are a great companion. It's, yeah, I mean, they're, they're fantastic. We, I, yeah. I must admit, my my intake has um, reduced because I used to do it on the commute um, into my office um, while I was still working in corporate, and that was my, as you say, companion. That was go in, listen to a story. I listen to it at two times speed as well. My brain now uh, assimilates it faster. I think awesome. every that's one of my life hacks. Like if you're listening to audio, but put it on two times speed because your your brain just reacts and starts assimilating the information, even though it's coming through faster. Um, Thank you. So that's so a, try that's that. That's a out. great. That's a great tip. Try that. I, nev out. I never works. thought of doing it, but that's why I did never thought of doing it because when I tried 1.5, it was so uncomfortable. No, the the thing yeah, is, no, no, I know, you, I know. You, you, yeah. you literally have to do like two or three times yeah. of trying it Forget and then it, your yeah. brain just switches exactly and then it goes into that that level as well exactly exactly no 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 you just absolutely i mean i i, I am a follower of a guy called um dr joe Dispenza. yeah and he, he talks about he's one of the most famous neuroscientists mm. very 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 respected because he's very science-based mm. and he talks about neural connections how they are being built how they are being if you want to change your limiting beliefs, how do you have to replace them by others? These kind of things. But now that you said it, I, I immediately saw it. Yeah, it exactly. Worked. That's that's the place. You have to be on an uncomfortable place. Yes. As many other things in life, you have so to be in an uncomfortable place in order to get yourself into a completely different level. Yeah. And guess what? You just said it. It's a it's a life hack. Yeah. It's a life hack. I'm going to do this immediately. I mean, thank you. <laughs> well, don't thank do it until you. we finish the interview. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, but, but I mean, just because of this, this is a life changing piece of advice. Thank you, Mark. Well, no, honestly. My, my absolute pleasure. Um, so, so let's move from Mexico. You then moved to Dallas. And yes. I thought it was really interesting when I started reading. So, was it, I don't know how to pronounce, Dassault Systems? Yes. To sort systems. Yes. So you moved, you moved there, and you were doing the Mexico account in in in, in the yeah. office. But you you did sales and marketing. You were there ten years, so you were there a substantial period of time. Absolutely, you did marketing and sales, account management, sales leadership. So, what made you like? First of all, what made you move to Dallas, and then what what? Why were you compelled to stay there for such a long period? Yes. Um... The first thing, the, I mean, I, I moved to Dallas because at some point in 2010, my, you know, the vice president for sales, they, he came into the country and he said, hey, Angel, if you want to offer you a better position, you have to move to the U.S. because we are a U.S.-based company. So if we want to offer you, so he helped me tremendously. Great guy, you know, and, and great company, by the way, the Sol Systems is a great fr French company. Right. Um, so that's the reason why I moved to Dallas. Also, you know, I, I was a bit reluctant in the beginning to move to the U.S. Uh, you know, sometimes Europeans, we are, you know, biased on our thoughts, you know, and, and you're- It goes both nothing. ways. So, the, some exactly. of the Americans don't, don't like it's, Europeans. Exactly. Well. But I have to say, you know, it was, a, it was a great move. Also, I had three kids in school age. Right. So for me, it was, it was also a very important thing to to decide if I wanted them to receive an education in, 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 in Mexico or in the U.S. So I, I kind of- we decided with my wife to do it. Um, so why I stayed so many years? So I stayed so many years because I, of these 10 years, actually, um, well, excuse me. Yeah, of these 10 years, the first eight, I was working for a division called SolidWorks, very well known in the software industry, uh, engineering, product design industry. Uh, and I really had a lot of freedom. 
I really developed a very strong business. I really, I was enjoying it. I was thriving. I had a blast. I mean, I mean, I, I had an extraordinary team. Uh, I mean, I did great things. I mean, and and uh, I mean, I, my work was recognized consistently in the entire corporation. So I was really having a great time, and it was really valued, and everything was, you know, I I, I really have to say. I was able to, to build a great team uh, along to help me do that. That's the main reason. And, you know, I, I've always, I was, I've always liked traveling. So for me, being able to develop business, to close sales, to negotiate deals with people in so many countries in Latin America, that was such a blessing. I mean, such a blessing. I was traveling all over the place and I loved it. I mean, some people are maybe reluctant to travel and you know, when they offer a position, they say it's 50% travel or 75% travel. Yeah. For me, 100% travel was amazing, right? Uh, because, I mean, that's that's who I am. I mean, don't ask me why, it's just who I am, Very, probably because yeah. of the languages, right? Because yeah. I, I feel like a citizen in the of the world mm -hmm. that I can go anywhere and I, I like learning, I like being exposed to new things and, mm -hmm. and that's who I was. Uh, so th that's why I stayed in the company for so long. And, you and was, know, there a, was there a... Was there a, a, a specific career development that was opened up to you? And like, not necessarily your first day, but in the first year, they said, look, Angel, we think you can go, you can keep progressing. Like, what, was, was it opened up to you or or did you have to fight for the progression? Like, what was... I had to, yes, I had to fight for the progression. I suppose you were in sales, so... <laughs> yes, yes, I had to fight had for to the fight. progression. You know, um, it, again, it, it, it is what it is. Uh, and again, you know, you always put, wherever you are in your life, you always, you have a, like a scale, right? Mm -hmm. in, your, in, your, in your mind, right? And you put mm -hmm. one thing in one side and one thing in the other. It's a matter of balance. Mm -hmm. So you find the right balance, you know? So I was really, as, as I, mentioned, I mentioned before, freedom. I had a lot of freedom to do a lot of things. You know, I, I developed a certification process for my sales force, a certification process for my entire okay. channel, right. distribution channel. Yeah. I, I, I designed training programs. Mm -hmm. I had so much freedom and I could do so many things. And we, we had no boundaries. We could do anything. And we deployed strategies in Latin America that nobody had deployed worldwide, literally. So that's, I had so much trust so much stress from my managers and the, and the leaders of the company. Oh my God. And, and again, I value my freedom a lot, <laughs> a lot. And, and did, you, did you have a coach or a mentor that you said about the person who brought you in? What, was, was that available to you? And not really. That's a great question. I, I, was, I think that I always learn through, through, through exposing myself, myself, through being in uncomfortable places, you know, I'm mm. being the one doing stuff, mm. you know, probably my passion and my enthusiasm helped me a lot so that when I, were pro when I was proposing something, people would, you know, go with me all the way. I was one of these guys that really would, I would really, you know, like walk my talk. Mm. So people would, you know, would come along with me, but there wasn't this written career path. I mean, I wish yeah. I, you know, because that gives you a lot of certainty. Mm. That's why, you know, I was, uh, People talk about the term like a corporate survivor. Yeah. In the sense that even though there was not this, such a career path specifically laid out for you, still I was able to thrive and I was able to get different positions. I mean, I started as a, as a sales rep or a sales manager, and then I started to incorporating territories. That's something that happens at corporate, right? You keep on bringing additional territories, additional revenue, mm -hmm. right? And and actually, eventually, when I moved to the to the US, I incorporated, you know, strategic accounts and accounts that were present at both sides of the or of the border, these kind of things. Right, right. Okay, well, let's fast forward a little bit. We're gonna, we're gonna, I, I do want to talk about this, but we're gonna have to move on. You're a TV host in, in on on a on, on a on a station in Dallas. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to keep going because I want to I want to get everything in. Go um, ahead. So so I uh, what I suddenly started seeing <clears throat> at a certain point of your career, you created C CEO Confident, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you started doing philanthropy. You, it's charity work that you started to do. So you became the president and co-founder of Wisdom for Kids. Um, and 
you also this is not so charity but you became the ceo of divine human ventures which is helping the gap uh, globally for companies to reach different parts of the world so so what what made you take that shift which is beyond the sort of corporate or entrepreneurial world into those areas as well well when I have to say, I, I started to prepare myself before I left corporate world in 2016. Yeah. I started to prepare myself and I started going to different conferences yeah. of people that knew about things that I thought could be valuable for me. Right. They were basically, you know, these famous online marketeers, these people that have done, you know, uh, online launches, yeah. that they know everything about coaching programs, you know, sales funnels. So I attended so many, so many conferences during 2014, 15, and eventually 16. So, okay, so I, I prepared myself for, for doing that. I'm telling you about this because in 2015, one year before I left corporate America, I had a spiritual experience. Okay, it was the month of March. I was wow. in Mexico City. Mm. It was a Saturday morning, and I was exhausted. I used to I used to like to say when I was in the UK I was knackered. Knackered, okay? yeah. Exactly. That's a great <laughs> expression. So I was I mean I, because I remember that morning very well because it changed my life forever. So it was at that hotel. Typically I would go I would fly back to Dallas to see obviously to be with my family on a Friday night, but I missed my plane, so I had to reschedule for Saturday, and I couldn't reschedule for the first flight in the morning. So I had to reschedule for the 5 p.m. flight on Saturday. So that means basically that I would spend one day less with my family. So I was really remorseful. I woke up, I was at that hotel. I remember exactly where I was, in which room I was, which was. <laughs> and I, as soon as I went into the shower and the, wa the water that Saturday morning, I, I, I had, and now I recognized it, right? Or I then recognized it. I had my a full, a full flight, like a spiritual experience. So remember okay. that what I told you that I had in Cuba before? Mm. So that happened, but with a lot of images, a lot of flashes, and a lot of things that made me cry like a baby. So imagine myself, you know, from the outside, you would only see an adult, a young, I mean, a, a young man crying mm. in the shower under the, under the water. Mm. But I was having all those flashes of basically all those kids in need that I had met so many times while I was conducting business in Latin America. So picture this, right? My clients were, and that's why I call myself the CEO confident. My clients, when, while I was in, in Europe first and then in Latin America, my clients were always large manufacturing companies. And I was always, because of the way we were conducting business, I was always talking to the C-levels of those companies. So I was always going to close business to these top you know, level the executives, executives yeah. of yeah. those manufacturing plants. But guess what? In Latin America, Manufacturing plants are where? Outskirts of large cities right. or even rural areas. Mm. And guess what? Where is the poverty? Where mm. is the poverty in those areas? Yeah. You know, in, 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 exactly, in those very same areas. So every time I would go to those manufacturing plants to talk to those high executives, before getting into those places, I would, fee I would see so many examples of kids coming to me and saying, hey, sir, senor, senor, would you buy some gum for me, some candies? Could you, would you allow us to keep your car safe mm. while you are inside of, inside of the plant? Or could we wash the car? Could mm. we clean your windshield for you? Mm -hmm. So all those images of so many, you know, so many examples of kids in need, and this came to me so strongly while I was in the shower. Mm. And, and, you know, and, and it was very clear to me after literally crying under the shower for 15 minutes, it was very clear to me that I had to do something, that that experience, that incredible amount of energy going through me meant that I had to do something about it, okay? So yeah. I remember that I was so sensitive that day, you know, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Mar Martin, you know, Mr. Martin, he he was the guy that was like my driver in Mexico every time I would go to Mexico. You know? yeah. So I remember having breakfast, he called me, hey, are you ready for the, for the appointment we're gonna have this morning? I said, no, 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 you're gonna have, you're gonna have breakfast with me today. So I invited him for breakfast and we had, a, we had a breakfast together. I remember that breakfast as if it was today. I said, Martin, you know, we are going to cancel this, this call and we're just going to talk about something that happened to me. It's going to sound crazy, but you know, we've been together for so many years. It was 2015 
Okay, so I would like to share a story with you. And that's what I would like to do for the rest of my life. And I remember even crying over breakfast as I was explaining to him what had happened, you know, a few minutes ago before, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's the reason why, that's the reason why I said, oh my God, I have to do something. And that's, that's what really triggered and ignited me deciding, actually I decided to, to create Wisdom for Kids with a friend of mine and his father, three co-founders, before I even decided to leave corporate America. But it was very clear to me that I was going to be the connector of the unconnected. Right. You know, right. the connector of the unconnected, mm -hmm. the connector between this top layer yeah. from a success and wealth point of view with yeah. the bottom layer. Yeah. Right. And I, obviously, through my work for so many years, I had not only sold and developed business, but I also had trained my distribution channel, my distributors, my resellers, my business partners. I had taught them how to become, you know, good companies, how to, I had helped them to grow their mm -hmm. businesses. So mm -hmm. I was always doing this, like helping these partners of ours, you know, uh, grow their businesses, but also eventually the main, the main goal of all the services I providing to my own clients, to those manufacturing companies, was how to accelerate the growth of their businesses. Right. So you see, there was this common denominator. So it was very clear to me that what I had to do is I had to start this nonprofit. Eventually, we called it, you know, Wisdom for Kids. But we called, you know, I called it, uh, I had to start this because I said, if I don't do it myself with these two other people, who's going to do it? Mm -hmm. Who is in such a good position of being able to, you know, tap into the genius of these top level people and yeah. at the same time helping the underprivileged? So, so tell me, tell me a success story. What, what have you managed to do part of this charity nonprofit? Yeah. So um, I like there's an area which I like to go, which is an indigenous community. I like to go to indigenous communities for many reasons. One of them is because. 95% of kids in those communities are poor. Right. So when you go to those areas, the chances of making an impact increases dramatically because everybody lives under the threshold of poverty. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you a story of this area. It's in the north of uh, the state of Puebla in Mexico. Okay. Yeah. So in this area, there are 180 plus small communities. They, many of them speak their own languages, you know, originally from the yeah. Aztecs, Toltecs, these kind of, you know, originally mm -hmm. civilizations, let's say, or cultures. So uh, one, one success story I can make is in a particular area, one of those sub-communities there, you know, we, we, we uh, when we deliver our workshops, right, what we do is we do a lot of self-esteem work. We do a lot of neuro-linguistic programming. Okay, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we want to make sure that whatever we do in that community, it's sustainable. Yeah, exactly, it's sustainable, right? So, so we went to that place, um, and you know, we develop, we, we we basically started talking about, hey, you know, you have to love yourself. I mean, th this is kind of the message, right? I mean, we don't mm -hmm. teach it like this. There's there's not a, there's no whiteboard. We jump, we sing, we dance, all sorts of crazy things that you can imagine. We do with the kids. Why? Because we connect with them again at an energy level. Yeah. We raise the energy of that place, whatever we conduct our workshops. And that's the main goal. The main goal is we connect with them at such an energy level that like the most amazing part of the workshop, which is a 20 minute meditation, has the most impact. So for one hour and 40 minutes, we are preparing our kids for the most important part of the workshop, which is the meditation. Right. I mean, you have to think that we spent two years preparing the workshop. We had two PhD students preparing the workshop with us, right? right? So there's these two kids, which were brothers, which had different, different uh, grades. One, I think one was, one was second grade and the other one was third grade. And the story, I'm, 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 the success story is because, you know, we always say that we help underprivileged kids in Latin America become entrepreneurs using their local resources. We don't want them to go somewhere else yeah. to be successful. Yeah. We want them to be aware, to become aware of the wealth and the resources yeah. which is around them. Yeah. Okay. So we told them, hey, okay, so 
what do you think you have here that people might like, right? And we started to have in that conversation, right? So, and, and uh, we, we brought the mom of these two kids, okay? We brought them and we say, okay, so what do you think we could do? And one of these kids really like, was very good with what he was doing with his hands, right? And we said, why don't you start making, and it's a very simple thing, but bracelets with yeah. stones that you can able, you you were able to find here yeah actually and 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 they said wow that sounds really interesting you know so we sit down with them we sit down with the mom and we made sure that you know they were going to you know they, we were going to have a continuation because the challenge there is not passing on the how to do something it's to do it it's actually to take yeah. action. Action. Remember, yeah. it's not. It's not. There's one mantra that I always share with my business, uh, you know, with my clients, which is take imperfect action now. Yeah. That's my mantra. Take imperfect yeah. action now. So we, you know, we sat down with them, and you know, um, that was at the end of uh, 2019, and we said, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. So we make sure that you know our local teams. We always have local teams. We develop all of local teams when we go to a community. Mm -hmm. They're gonna make sure that you guys uh, are gonna be following through. Okay. So yeah. our volunteers locally, you know, have been talking to this mom and mm -hmm. to these kids. And I know for a fact that these kids have been, you know, um, selling those bracelets right. to the local right. community. In right. this area, actually, there is a there is a former Toltec. Uh, um, uh, pyramid compound so it's a very yeah. highly charged again energy mm, place mm, it's mm, a very it's a magic place mm, so mm. they already have a place where tourists go so they can sell those bracelets already to the local community mm. and you know after that there's going to be many things that are going to happen i mean obviously unfortunately the world closed down unfortunately in yes. 2020 but we're talking about incorporating other nature mm. elements of nature into their bracelets and obviously writing a story about that. We are very cautious about keeping the identity of all those kids safe. We don't carry a single list. There's no list. I mean, of those 1,000 kids more plus that we have helped, we don't carry any single registry. We don't want anybody to hack into our information and use it inappropriately. We're very, very cautious about that. I think that privacy and confidentiality is extremely important today. And we want to keep our, uh, those communities safe. So that's a great example. That's a very good example of a, of a success story. That's fantastic. And and all power to you, I think, is a, it's a wonderful idea. And, and what's so great about it for me is that you're inspiring children to perhaps be entrepreneurs, but but in their community, in their country, they, they don't feel they have to go to America or go to the cities. They can They can develop within the local community, which I think... Is wonderful. I want to ask you a question which um, I don't often ask, but I'm I'm intrigued. So, so you've described yourself as a global citizen. You travel all around the world. You mm -hmm. are uh, you you've speak many languages, and and a lot of your time is is traveling. And you you mentioned a little bit earlier on about having three kids. How, so, how do you balance being a global citizen and also being a parent of three kids? That's a great question. And let me let me make a confession. Uh, I think that once my wife gave an interview to someone and she said it, so that's why I'm gonna say it. Okay. Um, at some point in time, I think it was in 2008, so two years before we left for the U for the US, actually, and she, she, she told she didn't tell me actually at, after th until three years later. So only a few months before she got pregnant of our second kid, uh, she told me, she, 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 she was actually thinking, you were spending, she told me one day, Angel, you were spending so much time gone, so much time gone. I thought our, our marriage would never last, never. We were living at Port, in Puerto Vallarta in the Pacific coast of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I, I would literally spend two weeks in a row gone. Right like gone and we we had a we had a, the, at that time we had a, an eight year old kid i was literally gone and that comes with a price right um so i loved obviously i was gone because i loved what i was doing mm. i i totally loved it but so um when um so that that came definitely with a toll 
right? And when I made the decision of leaving corporate America, actually one of the main reasons besides my nonprofit was I really would like to spend more time with my family. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, I've, I've, I've taken my, my second kid, my, my 12 year old now, I've taken him with me to do what I do. Right. And it's really eye opening because um, I remember when I took him for the first time, he, we got to the place in the mountains. It was a very poor village. Mm. You know, there was the, the, the Sunday market was on. Mm. It was dirty. It was smelly. It was raining, you know, cats and dogs. Mm. And my kid, like we, we had literally, I mean, we took a six and a half hour bus from Mexico City to that place in the mountains. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, and my kid said, Daddy, I want to go back home now. I don't want to be here. Oh, no. I don't want to be here. That's, that's I mean, the whole, <laughs> the whole landscape, you know, the whole scenario yeah. was so, let me use the right word in English, appalling yeah. for a kid that he said, I want to go back home. I don't want to stay here. I, I, mm. I mean, I really don't want to stay here. Well, luckily enough, the next day it stopped, stopped raining. It was, you know, as you know, in the mountains, then it was, it was warmer mm. and it was very nice sun. And then obviously he was involved in delivering the workshops. Yeah. He was in, he was he was one of the highlight mm. of the kids because they 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 got to see a kid from a completely different like yeah. life. Yeah, yeah. With them. Yeah. You know, and, and then he changed he changed the way that he was seeing the whole <laughs> wisdom for kids that dad is doing, you know. Yeah. And, and it was a great experience. And now he, he knows and he understands exactly what an underprivileged kid means. Yeah, yeah. And, and exactly. you know, but yeah. So, but it was, to your question, it was very difficult. Now I work, I mean, my office is at the second floor <laughs> at home. You know, we have right, a two-story right. home. Yeah. And, and it's different. And I spend a lot of time with my kid. And actually, now he's in school, but he, most of the time, he listens into my podcast interviews. Right. And not only that, I actually sometimes I ask him to write posts. He's brilliant. He's much smarter than me. I mean, needless to say, his genes are much better, like much better. And he he's brilliant in English. He's brilliant. He he got his he got this prize from his school for for his English you know skills. He writes really good. So he I, I and he has his you know his he made his own computer. And he has it like next to me here in the office. Thank God we have a large office. Mm. But I love to have him involved. And every month I have my daddy son night, my daddy daughter night, obviously my daddy, daddy mommy night, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Date night, we call it. But, but it's important because otherwise, I mean, you know, I mean, just to mention okay. something, the last 12 months, how difficult have they been for the families? Uh, do, do you know what? Uh, so I, I left corporate... Uh, in October 2020 so I'd sort of been living a dual life I had my corporate career and then I had my podcast and various other things and uh I was sort of leaving the house at 6 30 7 o'clock in the morning coming back I had US clients so I was coming back 8 8 30 really seeing them in the day and uh, and I think one of the things that COVID has actually done is so I'm working from home. We've managed to make it work. I can close the door if the kids are not if I'm doing an interview. But actually being present, it, it's it, it's not always that you are uh, like I'm doing a little bit of homeschooling at the moment. We're in lockdown in the UK, uh, but my wife's brilliant and, and she does most of it. But just being present and being around and having meals with them and having breakfast with them and and being involved in their lives has has is probably for me personally the biggest thing that COVID has given me as a benefit. Now, obviously, there's terrible, terrible stories and deaths and people I know have had uh, sorrow and sadness. But the one thing for me that's been great, it, it put it didn't push me to to leave corporate America. I was leaving. I just I just hung around a little bit just in case what was going to happen, because it was also new. But but I think the thing is making a really important point that um, that I wasn't I wasn't necessarily traveling uh, a lot, but it just the corporate world sucks you in and sucks you in and it wants more and more from you. And naturally your kids and your wife and, and 
and other and, and people around you they're the people that suffer you know it's 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 great i mean uh, if you think you know now that you have a I, um i have to say that after after leaving corporate i i was i was uh, by myself in the desert for many months okay wow. i had i had to adapt yeah yeah. I mean, for me, it wasn't it wasn't automatic, right? I mean, although I mean, I was successful and blah blah blah. Regardless, you know, I I, I thought it wasn't enough. Hmm. I thought until I, I one day I sat down and started to make some accounting, like accounting how many clients have I seen, what hmm. what were the achievements, how many people people have I met, what did I do to help them, what you know, all these kinds of things. I, I I felt that it wasn't enough. So you know, I mean, everything wor- works out, right? Yeah. It's true that when you're when you work in a, this large structure of a large corporation, mm. you give so much away, yeah. so much. I mean, and and you typically never feel fulfilled. You typically yeah. always 100%. feel that it's not enough. Yeah. You have to, you know, you have to give enough. You have to give more. You have to give more. You have to give more. And there's never, you know, one of the things that I will change if I was going back is the vacations. When right. I would take a vacation, I always have had my mind still in my job. Mm. Always. Mm. Mm. I remember one time I said, okay, I'm going to go really far. Like I'm going to travel, not to Europe, but I'm going to travel to Hawaii because they are in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. And I will have, I will not have to talk to any of my resellers, any of my salespeople, nobody, nobody. I, I just, I'm going to be there three weeks. Mm. I remember as if it was today, I couldn't do it. So that's, I was, I was a, I was a corporate animal, yeah. Mark. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I was like completely embedded. Yeah. Into I, that I, so work. was I. So was and, I. you know, and, and I didn't feel that it was wrong. I feel that that's what I have to do. I mean, I'm responsible yeah. for my business. Yeah. I'm responsible for my coworkers, for my, mm-hmm you know, direct reports. Mm. I am responsible for that revenue. Mm. And if I don't do it, I am not yeah. ethically and morally, I'm not doing the right the right thing. And it is so wrong. Mm. It is so wrong because you give away the most precious time of your yeah. life. Absolutely. Right, let's move, talk on some more uh, cheery things. So your entrepreneurial... Uh, experience is all based around the CEO confidence. So, um, so, so it's about sales, sales accountability. One of the things that I want you to talk about is, is a profitable custodian. Yeah, now, this was a phrase which I've never seen. Now I've interviewed probably 80 odd people, maybe. Yeah, about 80. And I've never said I've, I've spoken to sales people, people that started in sales and so what is a profitable custodian? Yeah, so this is that term that I, I um, that we, I mean, we, de- we, we developed together with one of my business partners, okay? So his name is Neville Joffe. He's a, he's a, an, uh, an executive educator. So one of the things that we tend to think as entrepreneurs is that we have to do it all ourselves. And that's so bad, so bad. I think that we have never been taught to really collaborate and establish a strong business partnerships. So that is exactly what I did with this uh, gentleman. So we, one day we were having a conversation and we were talking about this term and, and, and of the employees being the custodians of the company's profits. And I said, hey, we have something here. We have something here. What if we start, I mean, we really, I mean, if the main goal the ultimate purpose of any company is to produce sustainable profits and cash flow for their shareholders, for the equity holders of those corporations. If that's the main goal, mm. and what we are doing here is to remind everybody of the of the financial implications of their business decisions, mm. then every single employee is the custodian of the company's their company's profits. Right. You know, and you were in corporate, I was in corporate. How many, I mean, seriously, how many real conversations, in-depth conversations did you have with any of your clients or business partners while in corporate about financial statements, about balance sheet, yeah. about PL? Yeah. You yeah. know, many, but how comfortable did you feel? 
that's a different question. Yeah. How comfortable did you feel? Even if I went through a big MBA, mm. I really didn't feel. So when I was talking to this to to Neville Joffe, we realized that, and he told me because he had surveyed so many people that we really ne we are never trained at corporate to know to be aware of the financial implications of every single decision that we make. Yeah. It can be a discount, it can be a new product, yeah. anything that we do at corporate. You know, so then we came up with this concept, which is profitability custodians. I ran to GoDaddy. I protected the no, <laughs> literally. I did that that day. You know, when you have one of these amazing ideas. Yeah, yeah. I, I went to I went to um uh to to uh to GoDaddy. I booked the 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 the, the domain profitability yeah. custodians, and then we started we started using it. You know, and it's it's because it's the reality. You know, we are really not aware, even at the even at the personal level. I mean, how many families have a have a balance sheet of their own home, you know, uh, of, their, of their family? How many have a PNL? Hmm. Do you know the financial implications of a decision? Well, roughly, the the answer is roughly, right? Yeah, do you know something that was a game changer for me? You were talking about books earlier on. Yeah, Remy Sethi, who uh, wrote a book called make you rich or something and um and it was a it was a game changer again for me because it started talking about on a personal finance point of view having different accounts for different things so so we had a christmas account that we were putting money in every month and that when christmas came around when you buy stupid amounts of presents for your kids and things like that we had a we had a fund for it and we didn't even spend all the money that was available so now that's rolled on to um birthday funds when we want to buy the kids birthdays and I, i've managed to be able to separate so i now put every month a little bit away for tax um, a little bit into this fund i if my business account i always keep a, a slash fund available if especially on my properties or real estate if there's um if there's uh if there's a boiler going or whatever something like that so so that was really a game changer for me to actually instead of just having one account and so many things dipping in and dipping out and you can never control what's coming in or what's going out you just never have a concept of it so it sounds to me that you're 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 sort of giving that sort of responsibility to 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 the people you're training as well exactly so exactly so what we do is we actually start from the personal financial statements of every single employee mm. okay we're talking about i mean this um this is designed for both entrepreneurs and for you know corporate business operators let's mm. say so we started from the financial uh, uh statements of personal financial statements of everybody which is be, who is being trained mm. because it's it's from there it's from that position where everybody acknowledges what we're talking about yeah. that we then go to corporate finances and again it's the same thing whatever you are in the corporate arena whatever excuse me whatever you are in the corporate world whatever what whatever the place in that matrix of your company is that you are every single decision that you make has a financial has a financial implication yeah so basically that means that every time you make a decision you are you're actually signing a check but yeah. the CFO doesn't know, <laughs> but you're yeah. actually signing a check. Yeah. So every single employee are signing checks. That's why they are the financial. That's why they are the profitability custodians. Mm -hmm. And exactly. It's a very unique term, mm -hmm. but every single employee, every single employee is the financial is the profitability custodians custodian of the company's profits mm -hmm. because that's the nature of the company. And that's a blind spot. That's a blind spot. That's, but that's a big blind spot. We know we we run as you know we are very active on LinkedIn. We run a survey on my profile. I run a survey asking, yeah. "What do you think is the main blind spot of 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 salespeople in the corporate world?" And we expected that profitability would be one of the top places. It wasn't the top. It was not the top. So that's why again, even though every single company exists, you know, in order to produce sustainable share, you know, to increase sustainably. You know shareholder value and cash flow you know mm. that's mm. that's the main goal of a corporation mm. then very little is done at, at an employee level obviously the cfo 
knows knows what he's doing, but mm-hmm. how much is being done in order to align? Hundred percent, especially in corporate, because people that I worked with. So I want to talk about innovation, but just uh, just on on that. Go ahead. Uh, uh, well, j- I'll, I'll lead into innovation, but people that I worked with, they they had no responsibility for their products that they were working on. They turned up and they did tasks and that, that was, they then left. And they had, as you say, they had no responsibility of um, trying to, to make it more efficient or to raise revenue or go out. And the reason why I was successful in it was because I was interested in business development and actually finding new clients, finding new markets. So, so, I, I know sales is slightly different to what my experience of corporate, corporate America is, but how does innovation sit with uh, the people that you work with in the sales environment? So innovation for you in the sales arena is different to, I was I was in a, a, a KPMG and PwC in their software. So I, I, I helped um, sell and implement software. Um, but how, how does innovation sit for the sales market in corporate America or even in entrepreneurs that you help. So do you mean, are you talking about the importance of innovation within yeah, because my I, customer I think people, base? Or? Yeah, well, I think people just aren't aware of the importance of, of um, and I mean innovation as in making a difference, making a change, in trying to make something better, whether yeah. it's with a client okay. or within an internal system or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, in theory, everybody embraces innovation, right? Because innovation means you are able to create something new. We are all by nature creative. We love to create, Mm. but then there's this gap between, okay, I create all those things. You mentioned several products. Mm. You you create those products, but okay, in order to to deliver those, there's going to be something involved. Mm. In order to to market those, there's going to be something involved. In order to sell, sell them, so this is the gap which is being forgotten. So to be to be fair, because I mean, it's easy to talk about this, but in all fairness, the thing is how many of us, while in corporate, we got the right education so that we were fully engaged with the rest of the organization so that eventually the leadership team could keep us accountable. Mm. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. If you want to keep your employees accountable, it's not fair to do it unless everybody is really engaged because they have been provided mm-hmm. with the right level of education. And yeah. that's where the gap is. Yeah. That's where the gap is. And again, it's a matter, it's a matter of um, priorities. It's a matter of priorities. So for instance, I was also selling to many different industries. We were selling what is called product, product lifecycle management software. Okay. Right. So that means that our, comp- our clients would be like corporations that they would have some products that yeah. they would send to the market. And obviously they wanted to, to, to launch those products to the market faster than the competition, blah, blah, blah. Obviously yeah. innovation was always there because our tools were helping them to be really innovative and to, to launch to market, the time to market, right? Time to market, time to market, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? So innovation was always there. But again, it's not only that you have a great idea and you're able to make sure that it's going to fulfill your client's needs. It's not only that, because something that also, again, another gap, when you are selling something, how many times do you really care about the profitability of your client when they buy from you? Mm. Because at the very second that you close a deal with them, you, you become a liability. You become a liability in your client's financial statements. Yes. And it's a great, it's a great revenue for you. Yeah. But until, until, you know, the returns, until the client sees the returns, yeah. you are a liability. Mm. You tell me as a salesperson, how many times you have the tough, the tough love conversation, the tough conversation with your client in mm. which you say, okay, but I'm only, I'm only going to sell to you unless we really have a tough conversation about how that is going to help you increase your profitability. Mm. Nobody does it. Mm -mm. Nobody does it. Because why? Because it's a tough conversation. It's like, you know, when you're, when you're dating this girl that you, you really wanted to date, like you were, you were like dying to date with that girl. And then you, you immediately, for some reason, something changes. And she says, yes. And it's your first opportunity. 
Are you going to go raw the first day? Are you going to go? Are you going to tell her everything? Not the first day, not even the first month, not even the first year, because she is the lady of your dreams, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. We are coin operated. We are salespeople. So when we have this possibility to sell a multi-million dollar to someone, we never have these tough conversations. Wrong. This is the wrong thing to do because we want long term relationships with our clients. The best way to keep our clients alive and keep on buying from us is if we make sure that we develop that win-win yeah. in which they in which they recover and they make our that investment in our products and services profitable. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to have you back on oh okay <laughs> i'm gonna so, so I, I i what i want to do on the on our second interview i'm happy to do it is um is talk Thank about you. sales is is go deep in on sales because i think Please. it's the core of your business it's a core of your experiences Please. i've got certain views on 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 sales not not negative because I, I i think people's career progressions is based on selling yourself it, it's it's yeah. like you're selling to clients you you're yeah, yeah. selling yourself to your your bosses so so we'll have to get you back on um in in a Thank month you. or two um right we're coming to the end of the interview i asked my uh, uh guests six same questions uh they're quick fire right, questions right. they don't need quick fire answers depending on how you want to respond to them first question okay, is okay. what's the best decision that you made have kids What's the best piece of advice you were given? Be open to what the universe has to tell you. Okay, awesome. Who helped you most in your career? My wife. Any regrets? A lot, but I wouldn't be who I am unless <laughs> unless I had gone through those challenges. So that's okay. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a human being, so my my I'm still wired and I still feel that I did something wrong, but really I'm happy to be who I am with all my flaws. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, what are you most proud of? Well, what I, I mean, what I have achieved, I mean, I've helped so many people, every, all the lives that I have been able to change. Awesome. And what does legacy mean to you? Well, legacy means um, all those things that the people that have been able to impact uh, to your previous question, mm. all, all those memories, all those examples that I was able to, to give to all these people, the people that I was able to lead throughout my life. And that includes obviously my, my, my wife and my kids. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, where can thank people you. find you? Thank you. Yeah, very easy. Go to LinkedIn, Ain Rebo, the CEO Confident, uh, and, or send me an email. Uh, Rebo is spelled like R I B as in boy O. So my email address is angel as in heaven, angel at angelrebo.com. And uh, I have to tell you, or myself or someone in my team will be, you know, kind enough to respond to your message. So don't hesitate to write to me. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Angel. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. The pleasure has been mine. And obviously, thank you very much to the audience who has been listening to us today.